I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. When I was younger, I was into everything. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you are. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Trini Woodall, founder and CEO of Trini London. Okay, ladies, have a great day. I think a lot of the time we can do the obligation of other people. So why don't I try and lean into what I love as opposed to do the obligation? What what do I really want to be doing? Ask yourself and challenge yourself because that's what I do in my life. Because when we're full of fear and we get paralyzed, we can't move forward, we cannot see what we are. What are the different things that contribute to having less fear in our life? It changes in our life what kind of relationships we're in. Should you be in a relationship to complete yourself or are you in relationships that it brings something else extra into your life that is just utterly joyful? Would you say you've made mistakes? <sighs> you and I feel people mm. and we know what we've done. We know what we're good at. We know what we're bad at. And the people closest to us know that as well. If you cannot find happiness within yourself, you cannot be the right person for the people in your life who mean the most to you. If we live in the past or we live in the future, we're not going to make the present happen. Trini Woodall, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. I walked here today from my office in the city, which is about a 2K walk, and uh, I started thinking about today's pod and I thought, oh my God, what are you wearing, Mark? You didn't. Uh, I did. Really? And I started thinking about what not to wear. Then I got quite concerned about presenting myself in front of you. And I actually quickly was talking to my son outside before we, I came in and I was, we were looking through your Insta and I thought her clothing choices are unbelievable. Everything's like perfect on you. And, uh, and I started thinking to myself, I look like a shit bag. And, uh, and I started worrying about all the stuff on my shoulders. I had some, some must have brushed a white towel at home this morning. <laughs> this and a, do you, this given is the weird, you've, you've never started a podcast, never, this conversation. Have never, you? never, never. I mean, it's crazy. Also, 20 years ago, what were you doing? Uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was in the middle of a divorce, actually, exactly 20 years ago. And what work were you doing? Oh, what work was doing? Um, I was running a, big mortgage business, All right. a very big one. Okay, I still run one today. I still own yeah. one. Um, but that, a different one. But I'd What are you known it. for now? Uh, lending money to people to buy homes. Okay. So you're still known for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I still own one of the biggest home lenders in the country. Hang on. Why don't we just swap position here? Take No, this. I want to know. <laughs> I want to understand because I... No, no. That's what I did. I, yeah. was a, I, was a, I was a home lender and I'm still am a home lender for people who want to buy homes and want to buy property portfolios, et cetera, like that. So... You know, we were one of the largest in the country. By I far. love the way you already emotionalize it. E emotionalize it? Yeah. In terms you don't of... say, I'm a mortgage broker. No, I'm you not say, a broker. You say, I'm a home lender. Yeah, well, it's that... emotional. You're, well, uh, you're facilitating the ability for people to have their home. Well, that's my purpose. Yeah. Well, I know, but I like it. I yeah. get a lot from how you described it. Uh, because I don't, well, to be honest with you, I'm not, I've never actually been a mortgage broker. I mean, I have two and a half thousand mortgage brokers work for me, Yes, um, but I've never done one. So I've never actually... But that's the business you're in. But the business I'm in, in is lending money to people to, to achieve their hopes and dreams. That's my deal. Yeah. That's my deal. And uh, and it actually gets me up every day, apart from this show. I mean, I love this show. This is more, uh, I wouldn't call it a side, started off as a side hustle, but this is more fun. Yeah. Uh, the other one's much more serious. It's a very Maybe serious Maybe this is business. more expressive for you. Well, I get to meet people like you, um, I, and I'm privileged to meet every single person who sits in that chair, and I get to hear about their story, mm -hmm. and I get an opportunity to express that to the audience and ask questions that someone like me would ask if, um, or which any one of them might want to ask if they had an opportunity to sit down and talk to Trini Whittle one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, you know, and that's hard for everybody. Like a couple hundred thousand people can't come in and sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk to you. I'm sort of there... Um, representative today that in itself is a privilege just not only to meet you but actually to talk on behalf of them yeah to ask questions on behalf mm -hmm. of them so i want to go back to i actually would like to know who the hell you are like uh not today i mean there's a lot written about you today and there's lots of places i can find out about you today but in terms of who were you when you were growing up did you ever think you're going to become this mega star of makeup beauty opinions on, on, on how people should dress, etc. And someone who's admittedly recognized, who were you as a kid? As a kid, depends on the age. So yeah, let's a, pick them as a teenager. Okay, as a teenager. A teenager, I was spotty. That's the first way I describe myself. Really, as in pimples? Yeah, really yep. bad acne. So really? kind of 
self-worth affected by that probably because being a girl, being a teenager, really bad skin. So that affected me. I wasn't good at school. I was like 26 out of 27 at school. So I always felt back of the class. Um, I had had, until I was 15, a very popular older sister at, my, at the schools I'd been at. And she was naughty and popular. So the teachers hated her and the girls loved her. So she was cool. She was super cool. So I lived in her shadow. So when I was 15, things changed a bit. That my, my sister, who I love very much, but she left the school so I could sort of find my own person. My skin was really shitty still. But I, I worked out how to be friends with people. And I think that's a defining moment in any teenager's life is when you work out relationships a little bit better. So that was kind of good. And then, you know, lots of insecurities in my late teens, did drugs, got clean at 26. So that kind of period of 18 to 26, didn't love. You didn't love, you loved it at the time though. Mm, running away from myself a lot. Is that like a, a bit of a self-destruct program? What do you think? Have you ever done that? Uh, I did it uh, in a later period in my life, not that period. Um, when I was sort of rampant, um, it was more because I was let, I got divorced. Um, I've been divorced a few times, but I got divorced during that period. And all of a sudden um, I was hanging out with guys who were like that. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit more, I was a bit more just doing what everyone else was doing. Yeah. I wasn't sort of running away, running into, I didn't enjoy it, I didn't hate it. I, I just, but you did it. just did it because they did it. It was a thing. It was a thing. And you just then one the day woke up and just thought it's not a thing anymore for well, me. Well, I got remarried and uh, I started having kids and I just couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't function. Yeah. You know, like if I had no responsibilities that, prior to that, I could do whatever the hell I wanted. And, uh, and I was lucky. I, I was working in a law firm. Um, I had making, I was earning good money, had no responsibilities. And, uh, my brother and I lived together. It was like, you know, like it was what a do front house want. for 24 year olds, totally 30 year olds. Yeah. yeah. Whichever well, we marriage, had a really whichever marriage you were on then. <laughs> uh, well, I'd post I was after my first one and before my second one. Yeah. And, uh, there's and been was, a third. Yeah, yeah. 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 Been a fourth. No, won't be a fourth, but there's been a third. There's you never three. know. Sorry. My brother had six marriages, so six? I just, I, I believe. Wow. How old is he? He is now 70. And when was his sixth marriage? Around about what age? When 60, did he learn? 60. 60? Yeah. Do you have kids with it? He has, I would challenge which are his kids, but there's a few of them. I got a mate who I was the best man at three of his weddings. I'm the godfather to three of his kids. He's been married 11 times. 11, and he's got, that's amazing. He's got 10 kids. Yeah. Does and he remember which one is from which mother? Uh, does he? Yeah. Or do I? Um, well, it I wouldn't expect you to, by the way. But I sort of do. Um, more than him. I've known him forever. Um, yeah. But this is a bit bizarre. But he was married to one one girl, and then he had a kid to her, mm -hmm. and then he married her sister mm -hmm. and had a kid to her. Mm -hmm. Like that is bizarre. Like yeah, he, he ran off with he's his sister. He's creating a lot of cousin cousins. Well, I don't even know what they are. I don't know where they fit into the category. Or what? Or how you sort of? They shouldn't marry each other. Is all I could say. They all, uh, do the kids all like each other? No, Ma they shouldn't marry each other. No, definitely that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but it was like he was, uh, but he, he was the sort of guy who would immediately fall in love with somebody. So he would fall in love with you for sure. If he was sitting here now, an hour, with an hour or so, he'd be holding your hand or he'd trying to hold your hand. It takes two, but he'd be trying to hold your hand for sure. Um, he's just that type of dude. Okay. And he's still doing it. He lives in Bali these days and uh, he's still falling in love with women. All the time. How much would he love it that we're spending quite a lot of time talking about him on the podcast? Um, he's someone who, you just uh, made me think of him. He's someone who sits in my memory. It's it, He represents a big part of my life many, many years ago. And it's someone I never, ever forget. And it was his birthday three weeks ago. But let's talk about Trini Woodall. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so enjoying You did a very good job friends. of diverting me. <laughs> so you, you spent a period of your life up into the mid-20s, hanging out, being a bit crazy, um, running away, running into... Sort of ruining yourself a little bit, I guess. What made you change your mind about what you're going to do when you're in your mid-20s? How did you change direction? First of all, ruining myself a little bit, I guess, is not the way I'd phrase it. I'd probably say learning what I didn't want in my life is the better way of phrasing it. Yeah, what not to have in your life. Yeah, what not to have in my life. Um, and then I woke up, you know, hit a rock bottom, woke up at 26 and thought, what do I actually want in my life? 
And then I felt quite behind because my friends had, by this stage, graduated, gone to university. They were, they were on the hamster wheel of their life and I was like beginning it again. Um, so maybe more challenging, but also gives you more freedom, oddly, to think, what do I actually want? Not what I should have the obligation to do. Because I think a lot of the time we can do the obligation of other people. And the realization of when you get to a stage of what do I actually want to do and what do I love to do, that um, then slowly developed into, to an extent of what I do today of trying to make women feel better about themselves in different incarnations over a 20-year period. You're right. What do other people want me to do? Which is, I'm one of those. Went to university and all that sort of stuff when I was 20. What do, were you doing in a work sense during that period? Well, I traded commodities. I did Series 3, Series 7, me and about 60 men on a trading floor. Hated it. I used to go into work every day with the Financial Times on the outside and the Daily Mail on the inside. And that was literally the classic imposter syndrome. I hate that word. I think it's totally inappropriate. But that sense of I feel an obligation to be here. My dad had been a banker, but I hated it. I hadn't been to university, so I was not in, you know, the equivalent of hedge funds today. I was in the arse end. I was in physical trading. I did physical trading first and then futures trading. And I, I didn't love it, but I felt I should do it. And every day I went in hating it. I had to like say, do I really want to do this? And then other things happened in my life, which made me then have a bigger wake up call. And through all that time from about six and a half, I'd always loved making my girlfriends over. And that's what I ended up doing. From commodities trading, it's a big leap yeah. into, let's call it the beauty industry. Did something happen to you that sort of gave you a, a you know, uppercut? Would you uppercut yourself? I mean, or was it an actual no, I got realization? Clean. I got clean. Right. I thought, what do I want to do? You know, I sort of started over by not doing anything for a year and then doing a little job and building up and then thinking, actually, I really love talking about fashion and beauty. You know, I love that more than trading commodities, <laughs> you know. So why don't I try and lean into what I love as opposed to do the obligation? I think that's realization. That's the wake up call I had at 26. And then it took me a long time. It took me probably till 31 to get to a place where then I had a column in a national newspaper. I was writing my first book and then I was beginning to dabble in TV. See, a lot of people often are doing things that they don't really like doing but they just feel the obligation to do it in order to pay the rent or the mortgage mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be or to make to satisfy other people. Mm -hmm. But to make a decision in your mid-twenties to completely abandon, not abandon, not do that anymore and go and do something that you really, really love, that actual decision process is fairly mature. That's a really mature thing to do. And I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it in my mid-twenties. I didn't feel mature then, interestingly. So when you use that word, I'm thinking maturity, I don't know. It was more... I couldn't bear the alternative. So sometimes we do things because we are grown up and we make amazingly in, you know, informed decisions. And other times we just think, what's in front of me, I have hit a rock bottom of. So I have to make myself think what I really want to do. So between that age and the, you know, your early 30s, did you have many false starts? I had many false starts. I mean, I... I had full starts all through. Like I, I started being an entrepreneur when I was 16. I used to iron shirts and I got girls to iron shirts at school for other people. And then I had another business which sold hair bows and I, you know, went to Portobello Market, bought hair bows and then, and then got um, fabric from a market stall and then got these ladies to make these bows and sold them. Um, so I did all these things I started and then circumstances didn't make me finish them. I had another company called Mission Impossible, which is like a concierge service when I was 19. So there were all these stop, start, stop, starts. And then I thought I have to do a job that's a proper job, which is why I went into the city. And then when I was sort of 26, 27, I started again and I was an assistant somebody because I had no qualification. I hadn't been to university, nothing. And then I slowly, slowly, slowly got into this, having this break in this column in this newspaper. But my first, well, not my first, but my sort of full start was in 99. I came across the Horse Whisperer did a DVD, a CD, not a DVD, that was way too long ago. And in it, it showed that cable and wireless had sponsored it and they had something online. So I went online and I saw they were creating this destination. And at the time, I was fascinated by what online would bring. And it was just the emergence. It was literally emails were beginning. It was the really beginning of that time. But I felt writing a newspaper column, imagine if globally I could get to many more people. So how could I have a destination where women could come and, you know, by that stage we had like two million uh, readers. So we had a, quite a good following on this paper. But I thought, imagine where there was a convergence and I could do this around the world. So I went to Cable and Wireless with um, 
I, I, I had a cleanse one weekend. God knows why I didn't need to cleanse. I just felt I have a cleanse. Um, and it made my brain very clear. And I remember writing this one page synopsis and I took it to this woman, Jill Street, and said, I was with Susanna, my partner, who we were writing the column with. And I said, um, I've got this idea. I want to do this portal for women online. I want to call it Ready To. And she said, how much money do you think you need? And, you know, I hadn't thought about the finances. I hadn't learned to do P&Ls and balance sheets and shit like that. So I just said, Half million pounds. And I remember Susanna, sorry, I didn't mean to kick you out, kick me under the I table. She, I thought she okay. kicked you. Yeah, kick me under the table like, what the fuck are you doing? And um, the woman was like, okay, let me think about this and I'll come back to you. So two weeks later, she writes us a letter. I think we only just had email. I can't remember. I think she emailed that and said, I think you got the amount wrong. I think you need 675,000 pounds. So um, I was like, great. She said, okay, give me your bank details. This is dot com insanity time okay 98 yeah, 99 is like insanity time so Boom. yeah so a week later i had six hundred seventy five thousand pounds in our account so i thought okay now i have to build a company so susanna was doing it with me but she was also having a baby so we slowly hired people in i thought i don't really know about tech so i had somebody to do tech it was a time of pearl coding which is hard wire coding it's not windfall coding it's different and i had you know marketing i thought do I know how to market? You know, not really. So I had very high powered first in marketing. And then I raised more money. And I went out and in six weeks, I raised from two VCs seven and a half million pounds. Like, you know, it took me three years to raise for Trinity London 2.1. But this was crazy times. So I built up a team, 60 people, workaholic. I literally had um, a bed in the office. And all I could think about was work marriage was you know or my relationship was quite fractured by this kind of obsession and after two years dot com bust and i hadn't really monetized it i hadn't thought of that path to profitability i'd felt we would get a lot of research on women we got about 280 bits of information on each woman their body shape everything it was just like you'd come along and you'd say I'm Tracy, I'm five foot eight, this is my body shape, I want to get a red dress and I want to spend $50. And we had gone on the high street and we had photographed 6,000 items and we'd put them on the um, portal and we had taken your body shape and we built an algorithm to give you whatever you want and you would go to the shop and buy it. And how was I going to make the money? I just felt all that information I would use for companies that needed objective information on women, on their thoughts and beliefs. So the fundamentals were there, but the path and the timelines were shit. So I had to close it. So Susanna had the baby, second baby by this stage, and I closed the business. And that was, for me, where I learned the most of everything I brought to New London because I learned about who you hire when you hire too quickly, people that really drain the payroll. I learned about keeping close to you, the fundamentals of why you think you have a good idea and protecting that at the very important time, the beginning of a business before it's diluted by people who come in to help you to do things you don't know how to do. But the timing of that is really crucial. And so that was probably my steepest learning curve in business of how not to do something. So when I started again in 2013 of building Trinity London and we launched in 2017, all those things were in the back of my mind. It sounds like you sort of really jumped in the deep end. Like yeah. fully. Yeah. And you, uh, particularly when someone gives you a whole lot of capital and it's not your money, it's their money to spend. Yes. Yeah. What did you learn about your own relationships? That is keeping a relationship, having a relationship, because I've been through the same similar sort of process, mm -hmm. I guess. Running a business, running it hard, trying to grow it, mm -hmm. having responsibilities to stakeholders in my mm -hmm. case, then trying to keep a relationship at home. Challenging. I've done it differently in different situations. So in that first situation, I was married to my daughter's dad. And he, at the very beginning of our relationship, was the main breadwinner. And then my career took off and I became the main breadwinner. So I was kind of an element of dad, but he was not a stay-at-home dad. So he did his own stuff, but I was more successful than he was at the time. So that's also challenging. And I kind of never... People would suggest to me it might be challenging and I always felt it never was in our relationship challenging and I think it wasn't but I think that there were other things going on you know it was a challenging time and we end up separating but for other reasons slightly so when I was building Trinity London I was in another relationship as well with somebody who was challenging me and supportive but tough on me and supportive what does it mean tough on you like challenging my thought process 
which is good. Like, well, why do you want to do that? You know, why are you thinking about that? So, so it's great to have somebody who challenges you, who's done something. And the irony of it was probably that they had built a very successful business, which had to an extent destroyed their marriage, as many men can be in that situation. And there was a time in Trinity London where a lot of my energy was my work, my daughter. And so they knew that. And then they saw it happening in their life, which is a big challenge. Always trying to work this out, but for myself, but is it a matter of prioritizing? I mean, and once you prioritize though, if the person you're in a relationship with is not in the priority list, that is either one or two, in other words, business first, daughter second, or daughter first, business second, and then let's say that they're in the third place, is it a matter of, in your experience, is it a matter for them to find that as an acceptable position because they've got lots of other things in their life to keep them occupied? Or is it just the fact that they are happy to come into that position because you're already established in that position? You're established in um, one of Because for me, it's a difficult one. If you start off and when you let's say you're 25, you meet you're someone from school, you get married to them, whatever the case may be, you're hanging out with them, and then all of a sudden you start doing something that's really new and it's a new development. And all of a sudden you have you, the proprietor, you the entrepreneur, you have to start to prioritize things. Otherwise it doesn't happen. Kids always tend to get up the top of the list. In my case, it wasn't that case, but kids generally speaking get up the top of the list. Um, business is always at the top of the list because it just sucks you in. It's like a vortex. You, you, if you don't do it, you, your business is going to be stuffed. I was told by the, this person who was my last relationship that you should put yourself first, then your child, and then your partner. All right, which is an interesting concept there because he where told do, you that. Yeah, where does work fit in? But I think what I take from that is if you cannot find happiness within yourself. You cannot be the right person for the people in your life who mean the most to you. So where it's most challenging is when you put work first to such an extent that you empty your tank totally for anyone around you and ultimately also for your work because it's going to kill you. So the biggest balance for me is how do I put myself first so that I can be there for my team in a way that's not endlessly full of stress and being directed by stress and to be a sort of thoughtful leader for my team and not one where under stress that changes. And that's my biggest challenge for me. And then with my daughter, that I'm there for her, but she's aware that I have a career and I work, but that she knows I would drop anything if there's a situation. But, you know, she'll still call me a hundred. I'll say, if I don't pick up straight away and it's not an emergency, know that I'll call you back. She'll still call me 20 times in a row, da, 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 because she's my daughter and she can do that. She can do what the fuck she likes because she, she knows she has that power over me. And that's a indication of the closeness of our relationship. So in all of this, I'm not in a relationship, all right? And I'm thinking, where would a relationship come in? So this then leads us to... Why should you be in a relationship? Should you be in a relationship to complete yourself? Absolute crap in my mind, but that's like I'm nearly 60 and this is what I've learned in life. Or are you in relationships that it brings something else extra into your life that is just utterly joyful? And that's the only relationship I would go after now. So it changes in our life what kind of relationships we're in. And some are really good for us and some are not good for us. You've been married three times. You've been through this. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you said put yourself first, and it's an interesting concept. Um, some people would call that selfish, um, but other people like me, I would call that selfless. It, it's it's ultra right, selfless. Yeah, because yeah, I'm no good to you or anybody unless I put myself first. Yeah, you've got to fill the tank. So this morning I got up, and I could have got up and gone straight down to my emails because it's a big catch up because London's been burning. Um, but I did a meditation. I went on the car mat and I did. Michael, lovely Michael, who started Calm, who I was with dot com with in 98. Um, and I did 10 minute meditation at the daily meditation because I knew I needed to set myself up for the day. So did the meditation and then it was quarter to six. And I thought I can either just lie in bed and go back to sleep or I can get up and I can really look after my body. So it's going to look after me. So I got up and I went and did 45 minutes. And then I started my day, I did emails got ready, started my day. So that I need to do, because if I don't do, 
I'll be a bit hellish for other people around me and for myself, I'll feel exhausted. I'm on a kind of full on schedule right now for the whole of this month. Always we are. But so we've got to get that balance. And I think what I'm learning in the last two years is I have to get this balance in my life. You mentioned you're nearly 60. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm nearly 70. Um, And it's funny, it takes a long time. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a slow learner, but it's taken me a long time to learn this sort of stuff, Um, like a really long time. And I'm still learning, which is, that part's fun. Um, Do you feel as though you've made a lot of mistakes in relation to yourself and that when you sort of get to pass, say, your mid-50s, you start to work it out? Would you say you've made mistakes? No. I say I've learned from a lot of shit. Mm. If we live in the past or we live in the future, we're not going to make the present happen. It sounds very trite, but it's really true. So I can sort of think, oh, I wish we'd sent that email differently. All right, would, should, could. I can do that a lot, or I can consciously think, I won't do that because it's not going to get me anywhere. So do I look back and think, I made a mistake doing drugs? No, because it gave me a depth of emotional despair and understanding of myself that I wouldn't have got otherwise. You know, I choose to look back and think, what did I learn from that? What what did it bring into my life today? And that is very much how I look at life. That's incredibly powerful. In other words, it's win or learn. You never lose, never never really fail. Oh, we can fail. Yeah, but it's But that's not, different from regret. It, it, correct. Like and, that and business, it mistake. failed. You know, do I, I regret I, I did it differently? No, I just think I learned a lot from it. At the time, you know, Susanna had the baby, I had to close the business. It was really depressing when you've built something. And I don't know if you've always been successful or you've had something where you built it and it's Plenty. been taken from you. You know that feeling of like you, your baby has died. It's like everything you put your hopes and dreams into didn't work out. So you just, you feel, I remember after that time, I went and I did a retreat in Arizona in in this place. And I went on a cacti walk in the desert. And I sort of had been so frenetic on this kind of really crazy work for two years of just not putting my head above the parapet. And I just, I breathed, you know, breath. Like we learn breath mm. uh, way too late, I think. Actually, we could learn breath a lot earlier. But that was the first time I really learned breath. And I just was there and I just looked up at these cacti and I went, whatever's going to come into my life, just I'm ready. Just I'm ready. I didn't quite say I am a vessel because I'm not that, you know, um, so spiritually way inclined, but I have a certain element of spirituality. So I came back and so all those prejudices or, or negativity or whatever, or that exhaustion had been removed a bit. And then something actually two weeks later, a call came, which changed the direction of what I was doing. You may be not that spiritual. I mean, it depends what you mean by spiritual, but my sense of talking to you now is that you have a spirituality about you. I don't mean, you know, you're not, no, you not out there praying, yeah, but, I, know but what you mean. I don't mean that. Uh, but because it's that spirituality that you've got to actually get in touch with like when you're in the desert looking mm-hmm. at the cacti, you've got to get in touch with it. And if you can't get in touch with it because you don't have that spirituality, in other words, you're not open to it, you're not prepared to look for it, mm-hmm. um, It, you may not survive a failure. You may not survive a failure yeah. Yeah. to go to the next thing yeah. or to learn, to be in a position to say, you know what, that I stuffed that up, got it. I'm not going to make that mistake again. These things I'll learn from it. This is what I'm going to take you to the next stage. It does take a certain level of spirituality. And I think if you're not conscious and I like your view on this, if you're not conscious of the fact that you are exhausting yourself and you're not putting yourself first, you don't know how to put yourself first, then if you do exhaust yourself, that spirituality will disappear Mm. because that's the thing. You'll rob yourself of spirituality, that strength. For me, that's Mm. important. Mm. And some people say, oh, you're cold-hearted, Mark, you know, you don't give it to stuff. Because, you know, you know, like, you know, I don't know about you, where you come from in, your, in the UK, but in Australia, like, the media is pretty brutal. And the media can rip into you pretty hard sometimes. They do it to me. And Do you ignore it? Uh, not on the day. So on the day, I get pretty pissed off. I, 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 I immediately don't think of myself. I what has it think, touched in you? Your ego, your sense of... No, and um, I think of my um, father. My father will read it, and my dad's 90. He won't be happy with it because he's old school. Then I think of my, my I've got four sons. My, my sons will, you know, whatever. I think about other people, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't really give a shit what they say yeah, about me. It's usually inaccurate yeah. anyway. But, but uh, so I do sort of sit on it for a day, 24 hours. Yeah. But the next day, 
I wake up, I couldn't give a stuff. Yeah. It's like, you know, it literally is fish and chip paper. Yeah. What, what yeah. it was written on. Yeah. Um, and, and some people say I'm a bit cold hearted or what's wrong with you? Why don't you care? Because I am selfless. I, I, for me, I have to abandon that because I can't survive otherwise. Mm-hmm. I have to get over the top of that. Do you ever experience bad press like that? Endlessly. And what do you do? Endlessly. Every few days, something. What do you, you know? do? What do you, how do you deal with it? Um, I think when I find it the most challenging is when I might do an interview. And in an interview, I'm, you know, you have a lovely PR companies and everyone who would kind of say it's about this, whatever. And we told them, let's talk about this, but not this. And I'm generally open. I am me, you know, and I don't like holding things back, but I also appreciate things can be taken out of context. So I will do some interviews and something will be taken out of context and then it will lead with a line. And, and that's where I either, I have to look and think, all right, what's been damaging my ego? Because it might lead with a line of, you know, television presenter Trini. I've spent 10 years being the CEO of business, but never mind um, that. So I just think, oh, and then I think, whatever. It, you know, who this? Who does this really affect? It only affects me, that's fine. Um, other times, um, I am exactly like you. So I had some situations um, just when I started to learn where some kind of quite tragic family events happened. And I didn't want the real situation to be in the press because my daughter might read it. And I didn't want her to have that rawness you know so i was very protective i literally got her school to turn off her computer you know i just wanted to protect that situation at some stage i had to let go and i had to say she's got to find her own journey of this so it's like exactly like you when it affects people who are close to me that i love i'm very aware and i'm overly sensitive to how it might affect them but otherwise my i had an agent years ago and he said trini it's tomorrow's fish and chips which it used to be before the digital age it isn't now so, you know, if I have lots of great articles in Forbes and the FT and it's like I'm thinking this is good because I'm trying to raise money at the moment, etc. And then there's a personal thing which just sort of throws that all aside and it's something, one line I say and then it's about a sex thing and I'm thinking, really? And really this is written by a woman who came to do a business interview with me? Really? You know, that's when I just... Or or, or I, though, I think the one thing that... Um, we know how hard we've worked to get to where we are. And when I, I, there was somebody I went out with who had money and they would always presume they had helped me with the business. And they were an investor because I took a loan from them and I converted it into 2% of the business. And so the loan became a very Equity. big sum of money, um, which they- They got payback a lot more. Oh, yeah. So, but it's just ironic that that narrative was last a long time. And so I just have to live with that narrative. And I have to say, I know what I've done. And we know what we've done. We know what we're good at. We know what we're bad at. And the people closest to us know that as well. And the people who work with us know that as well, because we try to lead um, with some inspiration. So that's really all that should matter. And the rest is noise. It only matters when it affects stuff that is really important to both of us, like our business and what we're trying to do with something. You know, those. then it's like, then you're kind of juggling. You're thinking, mm, you know. But then we have ourselves to show what we're doing and to prove what we're doing and the people, and we know the people we are and that should be enough. Are your parents still alive? No. Who is it that you most worry about in terms of what may be accurate or inaccurate about Trini Woodall in the media? Is it mostly your daughter? Mainly my daughter and, um, and also it's what's interesting probably is how people who are really close friends may sometimes have a naivety around the press. So when I entered a relationship, there was there was a lot of things written and I didn't say anything. I think I'd done one Instagram post saying, I'm in the mountains, Feeney, I've got a change in my life. That was literally one sentence. But then, you know, the Times in England did this article and they made it look like I'd done a big interview and a big picture of me. And so I remember having dinner with some mutual friends about two weeks later and they said, you ran an amazing PR campaign at the end of your relationship. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, and they said, well, all those, and I said, you know, that wasn't me, any of that. So it's sometimes, I think what I'm, I don't know if it's so like trivial and I don't even give a shit. We are savvy and we know. And sometimes I'm surprised by people I'm really close to kind of think something because we read in the paper. Their naivety, you get surprised by their naivety or their lack of perspective. No, not their lack of perspective because I love them and they know me, but just, we 
we believe what we read. I mean, in this day and age, we shouldn't believe what we read because there is so much false news on everything. Totally. You know, so anyway, it's like, let's not go there anymore. No, the reason like, I say because it happened to me last week. So my dad, okay. my, my dad lives in, you know, lives in the city here and yeah. uh, in the city. He rang me on the money. He said, oh, he said, uh, I think his name's Bob or whatever. Down the road, I don't know him, but the guy's not really well, but older person like my dad. He said, oh, he came down and sent me that. He had a newspaper article, which, by the way, no one buys a newspaper. Yeah. physical newspaper anymore. Yeah, but this um, is your dad's generation, so oh, they do. That, that yeah. generation is. And I read this article about you and there's photographs of you there with, uh, pick, you know, I was a celebrity apprentice guy here and uh, had photographs with um, some celebrities that were on my show, which is like 2015 or something. Yeah. And, uh, you know, other photographs of me from 2004. Yeah. And uh, he said, is are these things true? And I, I, a bit like you said, oh, wow, dad, dad, you know they're not true about me. Yeah. Uh, like... Yeah. So just don't worry about the media. And I and yeah. I started trying to explain the media to him. And uh, and then I tried to explain the difference between one form of media, one mob of media, who one owner is media versus the other owner of the media. And I'm involved with, I'm in partnership with one of those media outlets. Mm -hmm. And the other one doesn't like the media outlet. And yeah. I said, I'm getting caught up in media war. And I thought, oh my God, stop trying to explain it. To your but dad, to me, yeah. who knows you really yeah, well. Yeah, totally. And these yeah. are the, but at the end of the day, Trini, for someone like me, I don't care about how much money I make. I don't care what, I mean, I do care, but I don't care. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing to me in my life is what my dad thinks. Yeah. And my kids. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I wouldn't say struggling, but I'm still trying to work it out myself mm -hmm. when I should be concerned, when I should turn the t turn the volume down. Yeah. You know, do I should I retreat a little bit for a while, let it all sort of smooth itself out? And there is no answer. There's, there's no, I mean, I had like a couple months ago and I said to something that works. I said, maybe we just shouldn't do any interviews for a while because I was just, I was fed up Same. with reading about myself. You know, I just was like, oh, please, I just, I don't, whatever. And then here I am in Australia on a press trip. <laughs> but I, I'm glad you're, and I appreciate you being so honest too, by the way. Um, you, your book, Fearless, yeah. um, do you mind telling me about the book? So Fearless is obviously by you, but it's a style of beauty life. Is this a new book, a more recent book? I just brought it out. Right. So tell me about it. So I probably in my relationships with all the women who I connect with on social, some of which customers are in London, some aren't. I talk equally about life and I'm very candid about life and the feelings about life and having confidence and challenging ourselves and all these different things. And then on beauty and on style and all the things that I've done for 30 years. And lots of people would say, where do I find when you talked about X, you know? And I sort of, I've done 11 books. I've sold 4 million books. I, I thought my book career was over. But I did them also with Susanna and I I thought actually, is there a place in the life we live in today to have a manual which has elements of stuff I've learned over the years? Like intellectual property in some respects. It, it is exactly that. So I thought, okay. And somebody had said to me, please, will you do it? I had a few publishers said, please, will you do a book? And I said, okay, I'll do a book. And I didn't realize also the challenge when you're running a business and doing a book, it's very challenging. And also the conflict between the book and the business. So, you know, to do a book, I thought to myself, that's quite good because I'm wanting to grow America. And strategically for me to grow America, it's probably me and then the brand. It's the DNA of me and imbued in a book is good. And a book is something that gets you on a sofa and on the Today Show and Good Morning, you know, that kind of stuff. Did so, it work for you? Did it get you on the sofa? Well, um, I do the Today Show in America, but yep. I haven't brought the book out in America until May. Right. So... Um, but I felt that was the purpose of the book as well. I, I saw this kind of work purpose and also that it would be very helpful for women to have this book. So I did the book and, um, and in the book, I wanted people to ask themselves. So at the end of each chapter, it says, ask yourself and challenge yourself because that's what I do in my life. I, and when I'm thinking about something, I will ask myself some questions and then I will challenge myself. I like to challenge myself. And I think if we challenge ourselves more, we can get through so much and we can have a world open up to us that we didn't realize could be there. So that's what I did. And um, it's in the Sunday Times bestseller list in the UK. I don't know how it will do here, but I'm I'm very excited by it. And it is, I don't like the fact my picture's on the front. Actually, if you do keep this book, can I just have it like that? <laughs> because it's much nicer. Great color, I love um, that color. You. It's my favorite color. And it's sort of this concept and the title is two words. It's fear less, be more. You know, so it's not fearless, it's, it's fear, fear less. less. I like and that. it's all around how can we fear less in our lives? Because when we're full of fear and we get paralyzed, we can't move forward, we cannot see what we are, all the decisions we can take. So what are the different things that contribute to having less fear in our life? 
So I've tried to put them in different areas. I used to work in India, and I, I, I used to when I used to go to India, I, to, I had a yoga teacher. It was a guy, and um, he once told me that f his words, "Fear is the greatest thief of imagination." It takes away your creativity. You're not saying don't be fearful. No, You're because, saying, I, because I, I read this book in the 80s. You might have read it called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It's a great book. And it's a concept that we can be aware of our fear, but it shouldn't paralyze us to move. And if we're not moving, we're going backwards. I believe that in life 100%, unless you're meditating in India with your yogi. But it is that concept that that, that movement and the momentum will propel us and give us that energy and move us forward. So... I talk a lot about how do we get energy in our life. A lot. Of my, I have most frequently asked questions: which colours do I suit, and how do I get energy? <laughs> so I talk about ways to get energy from a meditation, from a yoga, from how you set your intentions versus what you see as your challenges for the year. So lots of people will do New Year's resolutions, but I always believe, and it's the opposite in Australia, but you know, you have the end of the school year and you begin in September. So September for me is to set my my intentions. What what do I really want to be doing? You know, it, when I worked in TV and film, you know, and, and books, the contracts would always terminate in July and it would, would I be re- um, contracted. So there was always that anticipation and I lived in that place of fear in August. I never really enjoyed my summer holidays because I was like, will I be able to pay the mortgage in September? So how can you use September to think, what do I want to bring into my life? And then January is what are your goals for the year? And they're different things. One is a kind of broader picture. You know, am I in a job that will make me happy? How do I feel in my relationship? You know, there's kind of quite big questions. And you maybe have had a summer holiday. You, I mean, you'd switch this around if you were yeah, in yeah. Australia, probably. But so there's, and then there's sort of the difference between instinct and intuition. You know, so I believe very much that we should follow our intuition. And instinct can be the thing that makes us make the wrong decisions because we can instinctively hold back or we can instinctively be scared. Or get angry. Or get angry. That It's more negative. So to, to kind of look at those words and separate them out and see what is the difference and, and, and go in a bit of that. So there's... A third of the book is about that kind of stuff. And then there's a very practical level, which is your identity. So you have a, you have the kind of gray that I will probably go, which is kind of a mixture of brown and gray, right? You've got a red skin tone and you have got, what are your eye colors? A sort of hazily, browny, greeny, bluey. I mean, they're sort of gray. Are they gray your eyes? Yellow nearly. No, they're not yellow. They're not, well, I don't know what color because I never looked at my own eyes. Okay, I know you haven't. You're, but, yeah. but you still look Yours in the mirror. Yours are blue. You look in the mirror. Thank you. Um, so then I say what colors you wear. So it's like, this is your color palette. Lots of people just want to have, okay, give me a sense of something by which I can then experiment with. Whereas if I don't know where to begin to hone that in, it's difficult to experiment. So I sort of say, this is the color palette you could choose from. And these are the kind of styles you could consider. And this is the kind of makeup. And this is what skincare is. And when you're, when you're looking at skincare, look at the back of the inky list, which is the ingredients of a back of skincare, so that you can be your own expert in choosing what's good for your skin. So it's a whole mix. A book like this, an opportunity for you to articulate what you think about your own life and sort of to some extent becomes a great reminder of what works for you and maybe what doesn't work for you as well, but becomes a little bit cathartic. Um, you know, totally. Like, yeah. I mean, I read bits and I think, did I write that? Yeah, totally. <laughs> is it on audio, Audible? What? Is this on Audible? Yes, it is. How, did you have to do it yourself? Did you read it yourself? Yeah. How hard is that? Well, the thing is, the guy set two two days for the studio and I said, I'm going to do it in a day. Why are you setting two days? I don't have time two days to do an Audible. How long did you take a it? A day. You did in a day? Yeah, of course I did. I, my, my last book I did, I did, it took me, um, I did it over three weeks. I reckon no, I talk about an hour a day. I thought, oh, this is enough. I'll come back next week. Well, you probably then have a book that flows beautifully. I, I haven't listened back to myself. So I don't know if it's actually sounding rushed and like I've got a meeting to go to or whether it sounds like it's got a flow. I'm not sure. And I don't particularly want to listen back to it because I think I I might have rushed it. But I don't know. I don't want to stop you buying the audio. audio. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I didn't. I guess you can buy it online or, or, yes, or at all yeah. the good bookstores as well. Trinity London, um, and I definitely don't know anything about makeup so and or beauty care. Could you just give me a, a synopsis? of what Trini London does in terms of makeup and beauty and care. What's it mean? 
all right, I'll give you not quite an elevator pitch, but I created it because there was a sort of marginalized group of women, I call 35 plus, I call the grown up woman, who needed really efficient solutions that had integrity and were premium in terms of their good ingredients and easy to do because we're time poor, but still made you feel very quickly, great. And I would start, I knew, with makeup because whenever I did makeovers around the world, the first thing women noticed that make them feel in relationship and in touch with their body and everything else was makeup because they could then reset. So I thought I'd start with makeup and then I have five verticals and I know what I want to do. I started in 2000 and um, at 17, end of 2017. So we now have a million customers in 120 countries and we're 80% online. We sell about 50% in the UK, about 20% in Australia, about 10% in America and the rest of the world. And we sell makeup for four years and then we launch skincare, which is my second vertical, um, last year. So that is getting into what I, makeup I love. It's, you know, all done to me differently. It's stackable, it's portable, it's easy to use, people enjoy it. Um, and skincare is about integrity and ingredients. We have our own lab and we develop things from scratch. There's a lot of things that are white labeled in the beauty community. And I wanted to just be able to know every raw ingredient that I wanted to put in there and put them in with integrity and, and create skin that can change. So that's our second vertical. So and I've got three more verticals. Will you tell us some of the No, three? I won't. Oh, come on. No, no way. And, and obviously use it yourself. As, I want to ask you a question and I, I don't want to embarrass you, but how do you keep yourself so beautiful, like literally beautiful in like <laughs> your, your, your shape, um, the way you dress, um, I'm looking at your hands, your nails, your face, your skin, your hair. And that's not something you just did from 2017. So, I mean, obviously there's genetics involved too, but how, how do you I think, think you've done it? I think there's having, what helped is when I was 13, I had incredibly bad acne until I was 30. So it affected my self-worth quite a lot and it was cystic and I would hate like this kind of lighting I would be sitting talking to you like this with hairs in the front so I was so self-conscious and at 30 I I you know I tried every single beauty brand to try and help my acne every different type of pill you could take and in the end I took a pill called Rakuten oh yeah I know um, the one yeah yeah and I then got rid of it so so my journey didn't start of one of confidence. My journey started from a place of great insecurity, probably. I've always been tall and skinny. My whole, I'm the shortest person in my family. That helps. Um, and I've always felt, although I hated um, doing any games at school, I would put myself on the off games list because we had to do lacrosse and, and the cold winter things and we slept, we swam in a lake with eels in it. It was a very old fashioned school. Um, I never really liked sport, but I always liked Pilates, which I've done for 30 years. So I feel that any movement I do with my body is so important to keep me strong, strong and to keep my energy. And as I went through menopause, I realized I can't have so much sugar because the inflammation in our bodies we have to look at. We, we have to look at what sugar is doing to our body. You know this stuff because mm. I know you're really healthy, okay? So inflammation, and I, thought, I don't know if you know David St. Clair, I'm sure you've looked, checked him out, the Harvard guy. Mm -hmm. But just looking at longevity, I'm interested to know my mother had Alzheimer's and my father died from diabetes. And I'm really aware between that memory and that sugar, what I want to do differently. So I look after myself. Would you say you're very disciplined though, structurally? Yes, In a proper I am. scheduled way. Well, you kind of have to when you've got a lot going on in the day, so you kind of have to slot it in. But I'm aware that I need to look after myself. So where does nutrition fit into the beauty regime or regimen? Regimen's such a bad word, isn't it? It is. It's yeah, a shitty routine, word. Routine. Let's come up with another word. Routine? Yeah, routine. So where, where does nutrition come into that? And can you can you, can you you vary? Do you break out in, in, in terms of your routine? You say, fuck it, I'm going to have pizza and a beer tonight. Yes, for sure. Yeah. There's a very good place called Oak Pizza in London. It's my favorite pizza. My daughter and I order it. But I generally start the day. So when I'm in London, I start the day with fuel. So I have a big omelet with a lot of broccoli. And I eat broccoli first. I follow that woman, the glucose goddess, mm -hmm. quite like her. And I quite like Tim Spector. These are two people who I think they're looking at what do we eat, you know. And sometimes I see some days food for me is the fuel to give me a good day to keep me from having a brain fog. And other days, it's the enjoyment of that. I'm in Italy, you know, in Naples, having the best bloody pizza ever uh, or some delicious primavera risotto. And I want to just inhale the morsels of that. And food should be there to be enjoyed. But equally, I stop doing sugar in the afternoon when I'm at the office because it just turns me into a slug. Yeah, as in chocolate. 
No, I'll have dark chocolate, but as in like sort of, you know, something sweet and instantly fake sugary shit. Do you find that um, as you as we get older, and is there a does it become like an an obsession? Like I'm an, an obsessive person. With can we just say instead of as we get older, can we just say reframe it as we go down the path of life? As we, as we go down the path of Thank life, I'll, okay. I'll go with that. Yeah. Um, do you find that if you have an, a, an obsessive personality, in other words, a person who wants to try and perfect things, mm-hmm. I don't mean a perfectionist, just try to perfect things, try to get things right mm-hmm. and be quite relentless about it. Mm-hmm. Do you feel as though we start to um, direct that energy as we go down the path of life um, into longevity is a, a shitty word, but like trying to extend the period at which we are going to be able to function well for uh, beyond what would ordinarily be natural years for us compared to our parents, for this example. This is about this is a, such a subjective thing because I, I I'm very interested in the subject right now because I, I I was talking in a church in Bath a few weeks ago, and I was saying it'd be nice if I lived to 120. Now, there's good and bad in that. On the path of life right now, as the practicality of life, most people are in a job rather rather than being an entrepreneur like you and I, and they will have a salary and they'll have a pension. So things will run out at a certain stage. So life has been so conditioned over so many years that we live till 70, 80 or 90 or maybe 100. And, you know, you probably upscale and then you downsize and then your kids get a bit of cut money and they try and buy a home and you go to something smaller and then you have a little money put aside and then you live off that and then you know you've got enough to live off and maybe leave your kids some kind of general path of life but we're challenging that because we're saying we're enjoying this life why should we you know when i hear i have a, a female friend who said to me trini be aware you know you should really think about things like because you might only have 25 good summers left And I was like, what the fuck, Jane? Because I don't think like that. I don't think in terms of age. So when people then want to think into, I'm like, why? We're living this moment that we're living. We need to, do we need to be practical? I I don't own a home. I talk about this a lot. I don't own a home because my investment is in my business. Now, one day my business, I might be able to release some cash and I will own a home. And I will have faith in that because it would be silly not to have faith in that. Um, So... I want to feel capable. It's very interesting when we look at how people age because I can look, we can look at somebody much older and think, what is their quality of life? And maybe this is in our parents if we're in our 50s, 60s and think that's not a great quality of life. But people cling on to life, you know, so people's lives become smaller. And so what is around them is the most important thing. So we look with a bigger sense of life and we compare our inside with our outside, which we should just, it's never going to come up equal in life. So I know that I, I don't want to turn into my parents. I don't want to be incapable or my body, I can no longer, it doesn't look after me. So it compromises my ability to decide when I'm 80 to want to climb Kilimanjaro or whatever it might be. I want to feel as long as possible, I want to have all opportunities open to me. So I need to invest in order to have those opportunities open to me. So what am I prepared to do? Because a lot of people might say, oh, I really like drinking and I like lots of glasses of rosé. But it's like, is there a short-term gain to not a long-term goal? I'm sort of the same. So I sort of, I flipped it around. When I was younger, I was into everything. Mm Mm-hmm. And I lived sure every day was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> you gave me that look. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, and you're correct. Um, and But I, I, I lived every day as a transaction. Every day was I took everything out of everything. Mm-hmm. I, I consumed everything mm-hmm. I possibly mm-hmm. could. Everything. Mm-hmm. Today I'm putting things in reserve in mm-hmm. relation to my personality and my mm-hmm. personal life mm-hmm. because I want to live a longer period. So I'm a big fan of Peter Tia. Yeah. Dr. Peter, the American yeah. guy. And, uh, and I'm a, but I'm a, probably more a big fan of the science of uh, living longer and living better. I've got three grandkids now. And I, and I, I look at my old man. He's like, he's 90. And, and uh, my dad, that is. And uh, he, can, uh, he can do everything. That's great. Mum, mum died similar to My mum died of motor neuron disease, but pretty dreadful. You start to think about this sort of stuff. Yeah. And you start to break down your life. And all of a sudden, it's, it's not, no longer a, comp- it's not a compromise to me if I say, yeah, I'm not going to have that extra glass of wine. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to have a glass of yeah. wine. It's not a compromise for me to say I'm going to get up at five and go to the gym. 
um, and do a little bit of a harder workout than I probably should, you know, th- you know, compared to my age, that is. Um, it's not a compromise for me to say I'm not going to eat today. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have a day of no food mm-hmm. um, because I sort of feel like I'm banking something for the future. Yeah, it's a now, it could be false. Yeah. It's not false. I, I, mean, I, I, I totally might not make it, but I'm prepared to take the risk. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I'm like you, I'm lift to 100. Yeah. Healthily. I don't want to be a sort of getting dragged around in a wheelchair at, you know, at 90 or something like that. I don't want my kids to be pushing me around the joint. Yeah. I mean, I, but I do want to enjoy all the stuff there is in front of me. Like, I, I love doing what I'm doing. I love talking to people like you. I, I'd like to be doing this when I'm 80. You know, that's not that far away, but I would love to be sitting down talking to someone like, you know, Trini Woodall about what she's doing. And because it energizes you. Mm, so much. Do you get energy from the people around you or do you give energy to the people around you? Both. Both. Because I I have a lot of energy to give and I have a lot of people who feed that. So Feed it back to you? Yeah. Or just like you talked about filling the tank. So when I was in um, Warringah yesterday on the Northern Shore and we had this thing for 180 women and they all came and I spoke to each one of them for a few minutes and... They all had lovely things to say, but, you know, I said to them, you give me my energy. You know, I have only, I only have this energy because because there's this thing going on, you know, that we can't physically see it, but it's there. And, you know, when we were doing COVID and a lot of people say, you got me through COVID and stuff. And I was like, because I was going down the screen feeling, you and I feel people, you know, we go in a room and we feel that person who's most challenged probably. There's that certain ESP intuition and we need to give and and have that connection and always have i always want to have that connection i always want to be learning something i never want to get into some fixed mindset where life becomes smaller and is that why you do what you do because it's it is a bit selfish i, I can i get this part i can be giving all my energy to an audience but what the audience doesn't realise is I'm actually getting all their energy back. Yeah. And I actually think it's I'm probably plus one after yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. I actually, I mean, I walk off and feel exhausted, but I feel unreal. Yeah. I love the feeling. Yeah. Is that sort of how you roll exactly. too? We're very similar in the way you described how you give the people opportunity to have a home. So it goes back to that sort of golden apple, whatever it's, sorry, whatever it's called of that. Uh, Chloe, you remember it, what's it called? Thank you, the golden circle, because I remember Chloe showing this diagram years ago when we were starting to in London. But we do something and the byproduct is a mortgage for you. So, you know, I want to make women feel better. The byproduct is I have I have beauty products. And that's what we do. That's what drives us. You know, you, you make people feel better about I'm, themselves. I, I, I make people feel better about themselves. And it's the most motivating thing you can do. That's actually quite interesting. Um, I mean, in terms of um, Trinity London, that's really your purpose. That's the purpose of the business, put it that yeah. way. Is to make people feel better about themselves. Yeah. And everybody deserves to feel better about themselves. Everybody does. It's just like me. Everybody deserves to feel secure and have a, a, a roof over their head yeah. somewhere in their life, if that's yeah. their deal, yeah. if that's how they are. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm always saying to people, understand, you know, you, get, you understand this, the so-called why. Everyone gets writing about it. But at the end of the day, it's about satisfying some emotion mm-hmm. of the people you deal with. And like mm-hmm. your customer base or your audience, whatever it might be, and it's really important to tap into that emotion. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty simple shit. Like it's really simple stuff. People who run restaurants are trying to fill people's bellies to make us feel fulfilled and happy, mm. satiated. You know, that's a pretty mm-hmm. simple thing. So don't treat me like a shit bag when I walk into your place to get a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Treat me warmly. Offer me the coffee. It's a pretty important uh, thing that I need to have. Yeah. Otherwise, you won't have a business, and I'll yeah. never come back. Yeah. It's pretty simple. I, I don't know how um, um, emotionally uh, connected or, or I don't know how good my IQ is, emotional IQ is, but I know these th- th- at a, in a practical sense. I know that I'm f- fulfilling someone else's emotion. And that in itself makes me feel good. Mm-hmm. So in that right regard, I consider myself selfish. I had it's a guy. Not, it's it's. I don't care. It's a full circle. I couldn't care less yeah. if I I consider myself selfish because I'm actually everyone's happy. Yeah, I'm happy. They're happy. Yeah, I'm cool. I had a guy sitting here one time and uh, he, he's quite a well-known guy in Australia, and um, his kids unfortunately got killed in a car accident by a, a person who was um, on drugs who was driving killed three of his kids, and he runs a, a campaign about forgiveness now, and uh, I said to him, Danny, how is it you didn't feel like like 
grabbing hold of the person did it at the scene when you went and saw your kids dead on the ground. Um, you didn't sort of get angry and violent, which I, I, I just assumed I would. And he said, Mark, you'd be interested to know this. He said, first thing you want to do is look at my kids and, and be there with them when the boss are dying. He said, but the most important thing is over time, he said, if I was angry with this person, I had to be selfish. I had to learn to be a forgiving person in order to get over the bitterness consuming me. Mm -hmm. I thought it was such an unbelievable, and he's only a young person, such an unbelievable um, way of an analyzing how to deal with a tragedy. And, uh, and sometimes it is important. And he said to me, he was being selfish. Mm. It was about himself, mm -hmm. not trying to give something. Yeah. To, it wasn't a gift of forgiveness. It was a gift to himself in order to It was a him. way to heal. Correct. And for me, I think what we're talking about today, and I think everybody should consider this, it's nothing wrong with being selfish as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And in fact, if it helps somebody, it gives them something that makes them feel better. Like in your case, you make people feel better about themselves and feel good about themselves. That's perfect. Mm. That's the, a perfect formula. But it does take a long time to get there. Trini... Thanks very much for coming in today. I'm, I actually feel quite privileged when I mean, everyone here was raving about you before you came in <laughs> yesterday day when I'm getting briefed and everything. Um, but thank you for coming in. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, it's a big deal for someone like me to have someone like you in this room. And, uh, and thanks for sharing your inner honest thoughts. It was good getting to know you. Thanks very much.